question for you this morning as we begin. What makes you afraid? So I want you to think about, I want you to think about the, the one thing, maybe above any other thing, that sort of puts fear or even terror in your heart. And I want you to, to think about that. All right, how many of you have it? All right, all right, on the count of three, I just want you to say it out loud, all right? We're gonna do it all together, all right? One, two, three. All right, I, spiders and snakes, I, I got that. All right, those, those are valid fears. Uh, as, we begin, as we begin our journey this morning uh, of talking about what it looks like and what it means to have a courageous faith, right? We, we realize that fear is something that we all deal with, we all face, and it's an enemy of our faith. And so we want to have a courageous faith, a courageous faith that is not deterred. So here's our, our goal for the week. Our goal for the week is to develop an undeterred trust in God despite the danger, fear, and pain that we face. And so that's what I've been praying for you. I've been praying that God would do in our lives. And, you know, it, it takes a courageous faith to follow Jesus, right? Uh, our, theme, our theme verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17 about being new creations in Christ, right? We have a new identity, right? When, when you come to, to Jesus by faith and you believe in Him as your Savior, right, and, and you've been born again into the family of God as a child of God, your identity has changed, your purpose has changed, everything has changed. And God now calls us to live out and to walk out that new identity. But it's not easy. And it takes courage. And it takes a courageous faith. And so it's easy to say that, but it's a whole lot harder thing to do that. So hopefully over these next few days, and if you're here next week, as we talk about what the book of Philippians and what Paul has to say to the church, I hope it will encourage you and challenge you to have an undeterred trust in God. Right? And, and, and that undeterred, we said, I said last night, that word means persevering despite the setbacks, right? Despite the failures, despite the hard times, despite the, the moments of doubt, right? You know, if you've ever had doubts about your faith, I want you to know you are completely normal, right? There are plenty of people in the Bible who had struggled and wrestled with doubts. Elijah, John the Baptist, whom Jesus said there was no, no one greater than as far as a prophet of God. Right, so we, we wrestle with all these things, and, and you know, sometimes life makes our faith hard. The circumstances that we face, the things that you go through, the things that you see, the things that happen to us, and sometimes it seems like maybe faith even isn't possible. But I, I want you to, to see and discover and to know that God has made it possible for you to have a courageous faith. And, and a faith that, that not only pleases God, because the Bible says it's by faith that, that we please God, that we honor God when we trust Him and walk in faith, but faith, our courageous faith is also uh, positions us to accomplish the purposes that God has for us. Right? I, I want every one of you to know right off the bat that God has a purpose for your life. Right? You're not an accident. Right? He created you. He made you. He designed you. And if you're His child, He saved you. He redeemed you by His blood. He loves you. He he cares about you, and He has a purpose and a plan for your life. And if you are going to live out that purpose, you're going to have to have a courageous faith. And, you know, the Bible is filled with lots of examples of people who had courageous faith. I just want you to think about, and, you know, think about some of the examples of, of people in the Bible who had incredible courage. All right? And I just want you to, again, just let's, uh, on the count of three, I just want you to give me a biblical character who you think demonstrates courage. So one, two, three. Three. David. All right. I heard David. I, I heard several others. I made a little list. I thought about Noah, right? It took a lot of courage for Noah, right? When God says, I want you to build a, a, an ark and, and what he went through, Abraham, Joseph, Joshua, Caleb, Ruth, David, Esther, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I thought about Rahab, right? The incredible courage that she had to trust God, right? Even though uh, she didn't know him all that well. Paul, Peter, Mary, and Joseph, and so many others. And as you think about church history, there's so many people down through the ages that have exemplified what it looks like to have a courageous faith. But above all of those, our greatest example is Jesus himself, who displayed incredible courage as a human being. He was fully God, but he was fully man. And as a man, he displayed courage. And so Jesus is our model for what it looks like to have a courageous faith. So we're going to be in the book of Philippians. It's a letter that Paul wrote to the church that he really loved. It was a Roman colony about 800 miles uh, east of, 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 of Rome. 
And it was a very culturally diverse city. It, it was a place that was culturally diverse. It was spiritually diverse. It was not an easy place to live out faith in Jesus Christ, right? Whether it was, it was persecution from the Jews, whether it was persecution from the Romans and others, it was not an easy place. It was not an easy world to live out your faith. And so in a lot of ways, it sort of mirrors the world that you live in today because the world that you live in today is not an easy place, will not be an easy place to live out your faith. And that's why I want you to develop a courageous faith. And so we're going to take a look at the first six verses this morning, but primarily we're going to focus on verse six. So if you have your Bible, Philippians chapter one, and we're going to be in verses one through six. And remember, Paul, as he's writing to these believers, these were people that he dearly loved. He had helped found the church there, and he loved and cared about these believers. So join me in the text. This is Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So a fairly typical greeting. I do notice that as he says, Paul and Timothy, he calls himself servants, right? And if we are going to have a courageous faith, it begins by realizing that our lives belong to Jesus, right? For, in order for me, in order for you to have a courageous faith, Right? You need to understand that, that identity that we've been talking about is our theme, that I'm a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away, the new has come. I have a new identity, and part of my identity is that I belong to Jesus. Right? That, that my life is not my own anymore, that it was bought, it was paid for by the blood of Christ. And so Paul says, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. He's writing to the people, and then he says, grace and peace to you. A very common greeting for Paul, and it sort of incorporated the typical uh, uh, Greek as well as Hebrew greeting. So they, but it, more than just that, he was reminding them of the radical grace and peace that Jesus offered them. And that was the foundation, the basis for their courageous faith. Let's go on to verses 3 through 5. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers and for all of you, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And so, as Paul's writing, you can sense his affection for, for the people here. He loved these people that he's writing to. And remember, Paul is in prison in Rome, but he's not super absorbed by himself or his situation or his circumstances. He's thinking about others. And he says, I thank God. Every time I think about you, I, re I remember you. I thank God for you. I'm praying for you. And I'm praying with joy, right? Because why? We are partners in the gospel. We're partners in this incredible mission that God's given us to share the good news that Jesus is the Savior of the world for Jew, for Gentile, for everyone, that anyone and everyone can have life in his name. And so Paul loved these people. He prayed for them. I, I shared a little bit of that prayer last night in verses 9 through 11. But I want us to, to focus on just verse 6. And because in verse 6, Paul says this. He says, I am confident or being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And I, I want us to, to think about our courageous faith requires confidence. Right? We have to have confidence if we're going to have a courageous faith. And Paul, he, he says, I'm confident of something. Right? I'm confident. I, I am sure. How many of you ever, you just had a moment where you were confident of something? You just, you were confident. Anybody? All right. right. We all probably had them. Sometimes we're right and sometimes we're what? Right. Sometimes we were confident, but it didn't go the way we thought. But, but Paul's confidence here is a confidence that can't be shaken. Why? He says, I'm confident of something, that he, Jesus, who began a good work in you, will what? He will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm confident of something, that the one who began the good work in you, the one who's begun your faith, he's not going to forget you, he's not going to give up on you, and he's going to complete what he started in you so you can be confident. Confidence breeds courage. Right? We, we're not going to be able to have a courageous faith that meets the challenges of the danger, fear, and pain that we face, that meets the doubts that we deal with, if we don't have confidence. And so Paul wanted the church, he wanted the church to be confident because it is what is, breeds courage. Listen, God always finishes what he starts. Right? How many of you have started something and not finished it? Right? Almost all of us, right? We're, we're really good at starting things, but we're not always really good at finishing things. But I want you to know that, that God's not like that, right? God never starts something and then forgets about it. God never starts something and then just moves away from it. 
And it might feel like that sometimes. We, we might go through a season in our faith or our walk with the Lord where He feels distant or, or, or even absent, right? And, and you're not the only one who have felt that or done that. I mean, David, David cried. He said, God, why have you forsaken me? You've abandoned me. I don't know where you are. And so there might be moments, your circumstances, the things you're going through, the life situations that you're dealing with that make it feel like God is distant or far, but I want you to know He's not. He's not left you. He's not forgotten you. He's not abandoned you. And He will not ever do that. You can be confident that your Savior always finishes what He starts. And so our confidence is in Christ. And listen, this wasn't just, this wasn't just theory for Paul. Right? This wasn't just, oh, you know, I got a really good idea. I'm confident of something. This is something Paul knew. He experienced it and he lived it. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn back to the book of Acts for a couple moments. In Acts chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 16 and uh, verses 16 through 34, we get a, a window into one of the things that Paul experienced while he was in Philippi. So Paul is in the city of Philippi. He's gone there to to reach people with the gospel and to establish a church there. And it says in verse 16 that once as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future and she made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, these men who are proclaiming you, these men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are the servants of the most high God. And she did this for many days. And Paul was greatly annoyed. All right? How many of you have ever gotten annoyed before? All right. I see my daughter's hand up there. And it was probably with me, wasn't it? So if you've ever gotten annoyed before, you're a lot like the Apostle Paul. All right? Just, you can take that for what it's worth. So Paul's annoyed that that this girl is speaking out because it's not her that's speaking out, but a demon that's in her. So he, turning to the Spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. And when her owners realized their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. They dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said to them, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews. And they are promoting customs that are not legal for us Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined them in the attack against them. And the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and they ordered them to be beaten with rods. And after they, were severe, after they had severely flogged them, they threw them into jail, ordering the, the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them in inner prison and secured their feet in stocks. And so the situation is, you know, Paul is there ministering and he casts out this demon and upsets the people and, you know, and they put him on trial and he is beaten, right? I mean, severely beaten and thrown into jail. And we might step and say, well, what's, what's Paul's confidence going to be like now? Right? Because, you know, it's easy to be confident when everything's going smoothly, when everything's safe, when everything's comfortable, when everything's going your way, when God's answering your prayers, when, when things are clicking along and you're not struggling. But when we hit struggle, when we hit danger, when we hit pain, when we hit fear, that's when we find out what our faith is really made of. And so look at and notice what Paul's and Silas's response is. It says about midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. I mean, just think about this amazing picture. There they are, locked up in jail, bloody and beaten, in severe pain and severe discomfort, and they're praying and they're praising and they're worshiping God. Right? And how could they do that? How could Paul and Silas live like that? It's because he had a confidence that his life belonged to God. He had a confidence that even though his circumstances were painful, that God loved him and had given his son for him as a ransom for his sin. He had a confidence that God's promises were still true even in prison. He had a confidence in the power of the Spirit to be at work in his life. And so they were singing and it said, suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the foundations of the jail were shaken. And immediately the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. And when the jailer woke up, he saw the doors of the prison standing open. And he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he had thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice. He says, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called for the lights and he rushed in and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and he escorted them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus 
and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, along with everyone in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And right away, he and all his family were baptized. And he brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And they rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. I want you to see that not only was Paul able to have a, a courageous faith because he was confident in his Savior, but that faith, that courageous faith, positioned him to accomplish the purposes of God. Right? That, that God actually had a purpose in him being in prison. That God had a family a, that he wanted to reach with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he used unjust and unfair circumstances to accomplish it. Listen, there's stuff that happens in your life that's not good, that's not just, that's not fair. It shouldn't have happened to you. Right? It happens to me. It happens to all of us. But I want you to know that when those things happen, God is not out of control. God's not surprised, perplexed, or overwhelmed. And He's perfectly capable of not only ministering to you His grace and His peace, but He's also able to use your life for His purposes. Right? And so Paul, Paul's faith positioned him so that he could be used. And this man came to faith in Christ because of Paul's witness. Because Paul wasn't in prison complaining or whining or crying. Right? He wasn't he wasn't bellyaching or bemoaning his situation, but instead he was praising and worshiping God because he had a confidence in him. And that positioned his life to be used for the purposes of God. So I want, I want all of you in, in your time here, I, you know, I know we all come in this, to this place in a different place in our walk. Some of you may not even be a follower of Jesus. You've never placed your faith or trust in him. And, and I just want to invite you while you're here to consider the claims that Jesus made to consider the love that he has for you and the offer he makes for you. But I know that, that beyond that, those of us that are followers of Jesus, we all come in here at a different place in our walk with him. We all come in here having experienced different things. But I want all of us, myself included and you, to leave here with a more confident faith in who Jesus is and what he can do. And so I, I, I want you to develop that undeterred trust in God. Listen, I know that you're going to experience danger. I'm going to, I know you're going to experience fear. And I know you're going to experience pain. Okay? I wish that I could do something to protect you from those things. Right? As a parent, like, you want to protect your kids from things that can harm them or hurt them. You do everything you can to do that. But the reality of life, Jesus said that in this life we will face trials and tribulation, but to be of good cheer because he has overcome this world. He wanted his disciples to, you're going to face danger, fear, and pain. But in that, God wants you to have a confident faith. And so I just want to ask you this morning, are you confident? And if you're confident, what's your confidence in? Because when we're confident, sometimes we put our confidence in the wrong things. Right? If, if my confidence is in myself, it's not going to enable me to have a courageous faith. And we can be self-confident, right? We, we can think we've got it all together. We've got the looks, the talent, the ability. You know, and if our confidence is in self, if it's in my talent, you know, all of you are very talented, right? And if you put your confidence in your talent, it will fail you at some point. If you put your confidence in yourself, it will fail you. If you put your confidence in your intelligence, it will fail you. You need to have confidence in Christ. And so my prayer for you, the thing that I've been praying for you, is that God would be at work in your life to develop a confidence in your faith. That you would leave here with a, a renewed confidence in Jesus. And I want you to be confident of his love for you. Three things that I want to leave you with. I want you to be confident of his love for you. Listen, there are going to be times that circumstances cause you to doubt that. Satan will cause you to doubt that. Your own self and your own thinking. How many of you would say sometimes my, my worst enemy is between my ears? Anybody else with me there? All right, notice, look around. You're not alone. You're not the only one, right? We're all in this together. But I want you to be confident of God's love for you. Listen, God loves you so much, right? He gave his son for you. My, my kids are here. I think they're up that way somewhere. And, and, and as much as I love and care about you, I couldn't, I couldn't give them up for any of you, right? So we're clear on that, right? Like if something happened, I could, I could give up my life for you, but I couldn't give up their love, their lives for you. But Jesus, God the Father, was willing to give Jesus for you. And Jesus was willing to give up his life for you. And he loves you so much. My daughter, Lena Joy, is sitting up there. I'm going to use her for a minute. But it was a couple years ago. We were walking across the yard, and, and I told her, I said, I said, Lena, I love you a little bit. And she gave me that look, right? 
Like, uh, you're supposed to love me more than a little bit. I said, Lena, I love you a little bit more than you'll ever know. And I want you to know this morning that God loves you more than you'll ever know. You, you don't understand his love for you. I, I want you, though, to grow in confidence that God loves me. And the reason that God loves me is because Jesus died for me. He's made me and clothed me in his righteousness. I have, I'm a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. The new has come. I want you to be confident in God's promises to you. Right? God's word is filled with promises for us that are followers of Jesus. And I want you to be confident that God always keeps his promises. He's faithful to everything that he says. Listen, I've made promises in life that I haven't kept. And my guess is that you have too. Right? And sometimes we really want to fulfill those promises. Like we really mean to. We had good intentions, but we didn't or weren't able to follow through. But God's not like that. He always follows through on his promises. And then I want you to be confident of his power in you. Right? The power, the Bible says that resurrection power is ours in us. The Spirit lives in us. And there's power for you. That's how Paul and Silas could sing in a prison when they had been beaten. Because they didn't have just their own strength to rely on. They had the power of God. They had the Spirit of God who enabled them, who gave them. And listen, we don't have to do this. In our, we don't have to try to get courage. Right? We don't say, I have to have a courageous faith. I don't have to try to work up some courage. I don't have to stir it up. I don't have to psych myself up. Right? God himself enables us and gives us the ability through his spirit to have courage. And so that's my heart and that's my prayer for you, that you would have a courageous faith in Christ. So I want to pray for you and then we'll be done. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word, which is living and powerful and true. And Father, it is my prayer that, that your word in our lives this week would, would do a great work, Father, of informing our minds, but also changing our hearts. And Father, I just pray for each student, Father, each counselor, each staff member, each faculty member, Father, that you would grow their confidence in you. And Father, if their confidence has been shaken by circumstances, if their confidence has been battered by doubt, if their confidence has been just feeling shaky, I pray, Father, that you would encourage them today and remind them of your great love for them. Father, I pray that you would remind them of your promises. And Father, I pray that you would remind them of your power that's available to them. And Father, I pray that we would grow in confidence, not in ourselves not in our talents, not in our abilities, not in our performance, but our confidence would grow in you. And that confidence would breed courage so that we will be ready for the challenges that we face and that we will be positioned to serve the purposes that you have for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.